Well, it looks like it's showtime. Thank you for joining our webinar on evaporator pressure regulators, otherwise known as EPRs, and electric evaporator pressure regulators, also known as EEPRs. Some people call them EPRs. We'll discuss the operation of both valve types and how they can be used to control pressure and ultimately temperature in the evaporator. Thanks to Heatcraft and Don Fort for inviting Sporlin to participate in this program. Here's a promotion for two additional webinars that we've been asked to present in the coming months. Well, that's, that's if Don will let us come back, that mm -hmm. is. In October, we're gonna discuss both single and dual valve style head pressure controls. It's about that time of year to start thinking about it. Yes, indeed. And in December, we'll take you inside the thermostatic expansion valve, TEV, if you will, even referred to as that Texas valve, the TXV. The TXV. <laughs> used in refrigeration applications. There's a lot of detail that we can explain to you there. We hope that you will join us. Hello, I'm Jim Jansen, Senior Application Engineer for Sporlin. That's me on the left. I think we got a laser pointer that's working here now. That's, that's joining me is the famous John Whithouse. John is a senior principal engineer for the Sporland Division. I think I even spelled principal right, didn't I, John? Did you just say famous or infamous? I, that, yes. He, John's also a published author, consultant, and as I have said many times in the past, all around extra smart guy. All this means John's a big deal around here. We're really excited to have him with us. You say hi, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, John was was my customer when he worked at a former place of employment and he still speaks to me today i do i do even now if you have any follow-up questions or feedback you may contact us by email our contact sporlin technical support team at svd tech support at parker.com you can always call our general phone number that's 636 area code 239-1111 that gets you to our headquarters in washington missouri and help and you can navigate your way to the right group if you so choose. Also, uh, Don asked me to mention that there's a drop down menu when you logged on and you can download a PDF copy of all these slides and have them at your ready disposal mm -hmm. to use for future reference. So that's that's available for you to download when you log on in one of the drop down menus. Does that sound right, John? That's correct. I didn't screw that up, did I? I don't think so. Well, here's where we like to start. It, this is the basic and quite maybe unrealistic to a certain degree, perfect vapor compression refrigeration cycle. That means no pressure drop, isentropic compression, and all that kind of good stuff. But we mostly show this to depict the four primary components. What are those, John? Uh, that would be the uh, compressor, the condenser, uh, metering device, and an evaporator. That's the four basics. And, and every vapor compression refrigeration cycle has to have those four types of things. Correct. In order they for it to work. Have to have those four things in some form or another. Now here's a slightly more complicated version of the same thing. Here's an application of that basic refrigeration cycle in the form of a DX multiplex rack style system. And it looks quite complicated. It does. But, but just remember, there's still those four primary components when you boil it all down. That's correct. It's just how many there are of each one and how they are uh, oriented to one another. Well, here's something to think about, too. What do we have? John, if you count them, what, five Oops, evaporators? Five evaporators. Uh, so that would be representative of, say, five supermarket cases. Only five? Only five. When was the last time you went into a supermarket and only saw five refrigerated cases? I've seen five refrigerated cases, but it wasn't in the supermarket. Exactly. So that's, while this looks really complicated, it's really quite simple. It is. And we're going to talk about this highlighted area of the system because we're going to discuss these devices over here that help control pressure in the evaporator and ultimately the temperature that's in the evaporator. Uh, the little bit more detail here in this slide, remember that pressure regulators simply control pressure, mm -hmm. either inlet or outlet or differential. 
evaporator pressure regulators control evaporator pressure. It's really just that simple. That's correct. I guess we're done. We could call it a day now, right, John? Mm -hmm. We're probably going to do just a little, a little bit, little more. bit more. A little bit more. Now, the condition of the refrigerant and the evaporator is saturated. Saturated. Mm -hmm. So, as a result of that fact, by controlling the pressure in the evaporator, the associated saturated temperature will ultimately result in the evaporator through this control method. That's that, right. right? Mm -hmm. There's a correlation between the saturation temperature in the evaporator and the discharge air temperature or DAT or leaving evaporator temperature. Mm -hmm. I'm an old air conditioning guy. We'd simply call that supply, supply air temperature. Air, yep. Or for refrigeration guy, maybe air off coil. And this is based upon the heat transfer characteristics of the evaporator. Sporal and evaporator pressure regulators, or EPRs, are designed to provide a means of accurately maintaining evaporator pressure in a consistent temperature under varying evaporator load conditions. When the evaporator load increases, the valve will open on a rise of inlet pressure above the set point of the EPR. And so essentially the nomenclature of the valve implies how it actually functions. And we'll talk more about this. And this slide sort of summarizes a variety of methods to control temperature. You'll see there's solenoid valves and thermostats, and of course, EPRs that we're gonna to discuss today, and then electric evaporator pressure regulators, and then yet another method, EEVs controlling discharge air temperature. Those are all ways to achieve a similar result, but we're gonna focus on two of them today. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a little more added detail of the evaporator pressure regulator installation. We've included the serviceability of ball valves. What, you got a ball valve here, John? And That's correct. One over here, those would be good to have. Mm -hmm. uh, we've included a liquid line solenoid valve here before the metering device. And lest I forget, we've also included a liquid line filter dryer because we need to keep it clean, dry, and tight, as Don likes to say. That's right. That's right. You want to keep keep your refrigerant uh, in the system clean and dry. Uh, it significantly helps in the reliability of the system. Uh, helps keep from having issues with those next components in line, particularly the solenoid valve and the TEV. Absolutely. It's good insurance policy. It is. You know, here in this detail, we have depicted the use of a thermostatic expansion valve to control superheat over here at the bulb location. And of course, we have the evaporator pressure regulator detailed over here. Perhaps the only thing that we didn't detail is the high pressure pilot line for the EPR, uh, since this is a piloted style valve. Mm -hmm. But we'll talk more about that shortly. Now, there are many different types of evaporator pressure regulators available. Here you see the ORI 6 and 10. These are direct acting valves with standard adjustment ranges and fitting options. Over here, we have the SORIT 12, 15, and 20. These are externally piloted valves. And then over here, we have the sport valve uh, and then here in between the direct acting and the piloted valves, we have the SORT PI, which is a piloted internally valve. Internally, yeah. piloted internally. The SPORT valve over here is one of the many EPRs manufactured by another Parker division known as Refrigerating Specialties. Mm -hmm. uh, they make a wide range of products, and we're planning to put together a special webinar just focusing on those products sometime in the future, so stay tuned for Many supermarkets use multiple, boy, did I screw that word up? Multiple. Yeah, thank you. Multiple evaporators piped to a common suction header. That would be right over here. Correct. These evaporators can be operated at different temperatures for the various products being refrigerated. While this is a common application for pilot operated EPRs, depending upon the size of the systems, a direct acting EPR will do the trick as well. And that's what we've shown here. Just depends on the application and the size. An EPR is likely required when the desired saturation temperature in an evaporator or group of evaporators is higher than the saturation temperature corresponding to the common suction pressure. Makes sense, right? That's correct. 
The Sporlin EPR provides the flexibility to allow multiple evaporator systems to operate at different temperatures when piped to a common suction group. That's correct. So when you have a base suction pressure, um, your lowest evaporator temperature will be maybe typically right at that base suction pressure uh, that's on the uh, um, header. And then your other branches will be controlled by EPRs of various different types. Um, they could be piloted. They could be internally piloted. They could even be electric. Could be electric too. Understanding valve operation of different EPR models is, is helpful to ensuring proper product selection for each application. Traditionally, EPRs are applied at the outlet of the evaporator and control evaporator or valve inlet pressure, but that's all they do. Mm -hmm. uh, to further reinforce this trait, the Sporlin valve nomenclature describes the valve operation. What, what do we mean by that, John? So if we have an ORI, uh, ORI stands for open on rise of inlet. That's pretty simple. It is. And what? Definitely. And what's this? What's the T over here? Is that the T signifies that that one also has a pressure tap available ah. on there for checking the pressure that you're controlling to. So this says inlet pressure acts directly on the valve on the seat disc opposing the adjusting spring. Mm -hmm. So this is the disc. Here's the spring. And then there's a bellows in here that's sort of like a flexible seal. That's correct. And 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 our products, that's a very flexible material. And one of the things that people sometimes will do is they'll they'll overheat this valve when they install it and they can ruin this joint inside the internal workings of the valve. Right. Now, something that we get asked oftentimes, which I think is kind of interesting because you'd think it would work, and that's this this right here. Uh, the valve cannot be installed in reverse to handle any other pressure regulating valve function. No, it cannot. It is a uh, it is a one way valve only. So if you took a look at the position of the seat disc and the seat seating surface in the cutaway, you can kind of get a better visual right. of this. Right. So what happens if you install it backwards, John? Um, I guess if it net would now be a close on the rise of inlets. Yeah, do we have a need for something like that? Not that I can uh not that I can uh well discern. Maybe maybe, maybe an could it be an expensive adjustable check valve? Maybe it, it could act like that, yeah. 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 So uh you know it's uh maybe a little bit equivalent to uh, reversing the polarity on a light bulb and expecting it to make the room darker. I don't know. I I've never <laughs> heard that one before. I don't think it works. Okay. So, neither fair, does this. Fair enough. Let's let's take a look at this combination. We as Sporlin have utilized this battleship gray paint for years. In fact, we got a special deal on it after World War II, and we mm -hmm. painted everything in our building with battleship gray: desk, chairs, walls, product. Mm -hmm. And then when we made the the jump to epoxy powder coat, battleship gray was like the base model color. And if anybody asks us why we came up with this gray colored paint on a lot of our products. Well, that's the long and short of it. That's right. Uh, we commonly painted many brass and copper products strictly for cosmetic purposes with that, with that color paint. But because of improvements in our manufacturing operation over the years that enhanced product appearance, we decided to eliminate that paint on products like the ORI 6 and 10. And here you can kind of see the results. Here's the painted version. Here's the non-painted version. That happened right. long around about the year 2014. Mm -hmm. And you'll still see painted versions in service for many years oh, to come. Absolutely. These tend to last for sometimes many decades, actually. So you can see those around for a long, long time. And there's probably new old stock in certain locations yeah, that I you'll exit. Yeah, doubt that a bit. Yeah. Doubt that a bit. And, and we've offered extended fittings as an option on this product line for the longest time. One of the reasons was to simply keep you from burning the paint. That's right. Now we got a lot of information to share with you here. And it starts out with, you know, the SORIT valve as we've depicted here and here, use discharge gas 
pressure to pilot the piston. This requires access to a reliable source of discharge gas, and that means these pilot operated valves are typically not used with a so-called loop piping system. And, and why? Well, because a source of discharge gas is not likely available on the store floor. Right. So these, you would typically find these more uh, in the mechanical room, uh, a lot of times right on the, right at the suction header of the rack, instead of out away from the, very far away from the rack. And, and here you see uh, a, a discharge gas header, and it's connected uh, to the pilot connection on these valves. That's correct. It's also supplying defrost access if you're going to use mm -hmm. defrost gas to, to, to do that process. To be clear on that, there's no, uh, there's no flow of that gas that through into the EPR other than just to operate the piston itself. It's just, it's just pressure. It just it just pr that provides a source of pressure. Excuse me. Now maybe it's a good time to talk about the S in the nomenclature because we make both sorts and orits, and also as we get further into the discussion, we'll talk about sort and orit pies. But the sort and the sort pie as an EPR are available with a suction stop solenoid feature that will close the valve when it's de-energized and this assists with the defrost. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole part of the S in the nomenclature. That's Correct, it. suction stop. Now, John, maybe you could tell us about this high pressure supply source and some of the ramifications of that. Okay, well, in the case of the uh, pilot operation, uh, only refrigerant vapor should be used as that high pressure supply source. Um, we have some suggestions regarding the pilot source. That line should be kept as short as possible to minimize refrigerant condensation. Um, it kind of defeats the purpose of the discharge gas pilot if it condenses. Really? Uh, yeah, would it, sure would it does. Be a problem? It could. It could. So we really don't want. We don't really don't necessarily want liquid in that uh, in that uh, high pressure pilot. And um, that high pressure source should be at least 50 psi greater than the downstream or common suction pressure. Um, and if used with a gas defrost system, the pilot, pilot supply source must be at the same or higher pressure uh, in comparison to the defrost gas source. I guess that all makes sense. Uh, now, as you can see in our slide over here, one of the evaporators is depicted as being in a defrost cycle. And we can talk briefly about the flow through the components, including the check valve at the TEV location. So this one's in defrost. So that means this solenoid valve here would be open, Correct. right? Correct. The solenoid valve up here would be closed. closed. And so that would allow hot gas to enter through here and then to come through the evaporator, mm -hmm. clear the evaporator, and then we've included a check valve detail so that we're not trying to push that hot gas backwards through the pressure drop of the thermostatic expansion valve. Right. The return would go around the TEV and through the check valve uh, to get back to the uh, liquid side of the system. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And that's why this SORIT version is made available for the customer as an option if they decide they want to use that method. Mm -hmm. Now we got a lot of detail to talk about here. Sort of go into the details about how this valve works. So suction pressure enters the valve from the left. As you can see, we got flow depicted as left to right. So flow enters the valve from the left, travels through the pilot tube to the pilot valve. I guess that would be this line right that here, be, up here yeah. to the pilot, yep. pilot valve. And suction pressure acts on the bottom of the diaphragm. So this would be suction over here mm -hmm. acting on okay and when pressure is low the diaphragm flexes and it would be the diaphragm here in this pilot assembly and comes into contact with the push rod that's in this pilot assembly and and that would allow the flow of discharge gas to the top of the piston in the valve mm -hmm. the valve would modulate to a more closed position and cause the evaporator pressure then to subsequently increase, which is what we're trying to achieve. 
the pressure on top of the piston is constantly being bled off to the suction side of the system via this line here. Mm -hmm. This allows the valve to modulate to a more open position when the evaporator pressure increases above the set point of the valve. Piloting the valve with high side vapor allows a normally open valve design that can operate with a minimum pressure drop of a half PSI. That's right. Now, sometimes people get a little carried away with selecting these valves and it's crucial not to grossly oversize them, even right. though you're yeah. trying to, I mean, the goal is to minimize suction pressure drop in for good reason. For purposes of uh, system efficiency, yeah. Absolutely. Now, that S in the nomenclature, we already covered that. Uh, if the solenoid feature is not provided, this is simply an ORIT valve Again. without it. Mm -hmm. And the solenoid valve must be energized for the valve to be able to modulate if it is a SORIT version. John, you want to tell us about a little more comment here on the defrost cycle? Sure, sure. So in order to defrost the evaporator, the solenoid component of the valve is de-energized to allow discharge gas to dump on top of the piston and provide a positive closing action. So in that case, you don't get that bleed and that piston is forced closed, closing the valve. So we make both a sort version and an ORT version. Mm -hmm. But what if you needed to convert a standard sort 12, 15, or 20 to an ORT? Could you do that? I think you actually could. How, how would you go about doing that? Well, uh, you could install a solenoid coil and provide electrical power to it 100% of the time. Uh, you can also install a Sporland magnet. I think we've all seen those uh, on the enclosing tube and leave it that way. Uh, or you could remove the small push rod from the bottom of the enclosing tube assembly. Uh, just try not to lose it. Yeah, that's almost too small to see it in this. It is. It is. It's picking, not very, but, and that's not very not, apparent in there. And that's not something we necessarily recommend, but yeah, it could it could be done. Could be done, but probably not the recommended way. Well, what happens if the high pressure pilot source is closed? I think this means the EPR goes. Uh, goes wide open. Wide open. Uh, well, there's if there's nothing to drive the piston, then there's really nothing to inhibit flow. So if we put a small solenoid valve in this pilot line, that would make for an interesting application. Mm -hmm. We could use, I would guess, we could use that for a dual temperature application. I think, yes, I think you could. I think I may have done that in the past myself. <laughs> an auxiliary <laughs> solenoid valve could be installed in that discharge gas line that we're using to pilot the valve. And when the pilot line is closed, the sort will go wide open. Mm -hmm. And the case, what, what would happen to the case then? Well, it's going to operate at the common uh, header suction pressure. So it'd go to a lower temperature. It would go to a lower temperature, absolutely. Something like a direct acting small A3 or E3 solenoid valve could be installed in that high pressure vapor pilot line mm -hmm. to accommodate that function. That's correct. Now, Always remember when selecting solenoid valves that size does matter. No, no pun intended there. Yep. Uh, solenoid really valves are designated and designed to operate in conjunction with specific conditions, not simply line size. That's correct. What's a good example of a dual temperature application? Why would you need to do this, John? Well, uh, a dual temperature application that probably uh, most of us in the refrigeration field are somewhat uh, aware of would be things like uh, uh, a dual temperature island case. Okay, what would which, you do with that? Could be a, you might find in a deli or meat department of a uh, supermarket. Okay. And that would typically be, doesn't have to be, but that would typically be a case that could be used to display frozen foods, frozen meats, things like that. Around Thanksgiving. Around Thanksgiving, full of nice island case full of turkeys. We've, I think we've all seen that. We've got some of those around here and it's uh, not even Thanksgiving. Uh, true, I, and, uh, I'm not going there actually. Right. Um, and other times, uh, the case that case can be run at a uh, medium temperature and display fresh meats uh, of different various different kinds in there. So um, gives you the op option to do either one without a lot of trouble. That's right. Flexibility uh, in uh, merchandising food with basically just a flip of a switch. Now most of our EPRs can be organized in a manner that will achieve this. This is just an example of how it would be done with the sword. That's right. 
That's right. There's other there's other methods you can use, other if, other styles of EPR that you can use with if, different if you, components and get there. If you did it with a direct acting EPR, you'd probably need to bypass it with a solenoid valve. Right. You would need a larger solenoid that would just directly bypass that uh, that uh, that ORI six or ten in order to accomplish the same thing. Now we talked about loop systems briefly earlier. Mm -hmm. We mentioned it. And let, let's say you have a loop system and there's no ready source of pilot pressure to drive that sort. That's where a PI style valve could come in handy. And so that's what, if the piping designer or the store owner prefers, prefers this loop piping system in the store, that's when you could do either. Either the direct acting, mm -hmm. if the sizing is appropriate. Right. Or the internally piloted. You could use that on a system with the evaporator groups piped to a common liquid and suction line that has been looped throughout the store. That's correct. The EPRs are installed in or near the refrigerated case in this in this type of system. So it means that they are actually uh, on the store floor, so to speak. Right so there at the case. They're actually out of, in the merchandising area of the store. Now, examples of the direct acting we've already mentioned like the ORI T6 and 10, mm -hmm. and then now we're introducing the SORIT PI, which yep. means, I mean, we have people ask, why did you say PI? Is that Greek letter PI? Is that 22 sevenths? What is, is that 3.14? It uh, has nothing to do with any of it. Yeah, that. it's not quite that complicated. It stands for piloted internally. And of course, the range of refrigerating specialties products could be used in this kind of application. That's correct. Well. There are other products, there are other products such as the sport valve that can be used. And as you see here, we have depicted both a sort pie valve with a defrost solenoid piped in conjunction with it. Mm -hmm. And we've also depicted the sport valve, which has a solenoid stop built into it as well, and a, a two-way solenoid valve to help with defrost. And we kind of talked you through how that defrost flow would work. It's a similar situation. Yep. During defrost, the sort PI can also accommodate hot gas flow with the suction stop solenoid feature, just like the sort. And that will close the valve when de-energized, just like it did with the sort version. Here we've got a little detail on how the valve works. Yep. These valves are piloted internally and do not require a high pressure. Uh, source to operate them. The, so the valves are operated by the in, by the different yeah yeah easy pressure to say pressure differential. pressure differential. Let me help you there a little bit. Yes, thank okay. you. Uh, across the valve, and these valves do require a minimum pressure drop of one psi to obtain full capacity. Uh, so you do have to be a bit careful on sizing on these valves. Uh, if they're oversized, uh, it can result in erratic operation. And uh, the piloted internally valve uh, it still modulates in response to the upstream or inlet pressure, just like the sort. So it is still an open on rise of inlet, if you will. Same kind of deal. Yep, absolutely. Ha however, as, as inlet pressure is transmitted through the internal passageways to the underside of the pilot valve diaphragm, the valve works without an external pilot source to get the job done and will ultimately control evaporator pressure and achieve the associated temperature that you wish to, to do. Yep. The uh, sort PI version is equipped with a suction stop feature in the pilot that allows the valve to completely close for defrost applications. Um, you, you, you will note too, the solenoid valves energized to provide for the modulating feature of the valve to function, same as. And de-energized yep. to accommodate the defrost, defrost cycle. cycle. Correct. And so you've got a sort, sort PI can be specified with a also, with an optional electric open feature to achieve that dual temperature application function. Uh, take a look at the image at the right. Here we've got the solenoid stop as well as the electric open mm -hmm. solenoid valve. Do we have anybody trying to pose a question to us, John? We, we actually do here. Um, a question from Carson, uh, and uh, this goes to the sort valve. Not the, I don't, don't think right. I'm talking about the sort PI, but, this okay. is, but the regular sort. If the solenoid valve on a sort uh, is on a sort valve is closed, does it shut off all flow through the valve? And I think in this With, case, well, you need to, if, if, can I go back to that, to one of those sure. slides real quick? Sure. Let me back up just a little bit. 
And here we go. To get it to modulate, we got to have the solenoid valve energized. That's correct. And if we de-energize the solenoid valve, that means this valve's closed to facilitate evaporator defrost. Now, the question was, does that mean the valve's completely closed? I'd say it's completely closed with respect to, you got to keep in mind, depending on how long the valve's been in, fun, in service, is there debris in the system? Is there any contamination? Right. Is there seat leakage? Anything like that that might be thwarting the operation of it? But it, it basically does shut off all the flow, as you can see on the right-hand side of this slide. That's the intention. Yeah, that's the intention. Could there be a little bit of leakage on a very old valve that's cycled for many, many years? Yes, there could be a small amount of leakage through it. But for all intents and purposes, uh, that does drive that piston closed, and it does it does shut off the, the flow through the valve. There's a comment that I was going to make uh, shortly with regards to troubleshooting, and that is the single biggest culprit for the operation of any of these products is contamination in the system. You can eliminate contamination in the system. It's it's a good step in the direction of having good, solid, reliable operation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'll get back to where we were before. And we were talking about how these how the sort pi functions. And here the sort pi version is equipped with that suction stop feature in the pilot that allows the valve to completely close for defrost applications. Uh, the solenoid is energized to provide for the modulating feature of the valve to function similar to the sort yep. and de-energized to accommodate defrost cycle. And again, you can specify the sort pi with that optional electric open feature. I think the Department of Redundancy is coming into play because I think we've already covered some of this. We already. may have touched on one of those, yeah, at least. Now, here's some comments that we're going to direct towards some of the design issues and changes and applications with the sort pi. Right. Here we've got the sort pi detailed up to and including a date code of 3104. What's that date code mean, John? Do you know? That would be the 31st week of 2004. So this is uh, starting to become some semi-ancient history. But we know that there's a lot of these valves still out in the field, so that's why we're covering it here. Now, along the way, after that point in time, we made some design changes like this external bleed line uh, from the pilot assembly that you see here, sort of like we did, you, did you like that, sort of like, mm -hmm. like we did with the sort, sort of like, sort, that was supposed to be funny, I don't know if I, we added that external bleed line. Uh, we've got a threaded, removable seat assembly inside here so that within limits you can modify the size of the valve. Uh, we've got a new bleed style piston. All of this came about because there seemed to be a tendency to oversize these valves and that could be a big problem. Low load right. conditions, you're likely to get unreliable, sketchy performance and that the bleed and the nose piece helped to settle control and finally, that added one quarter inch bleed line really was a, a good step in the right direction. It was. Now, and this is going to be a little bit of hypocrisy on my part, and maybe a little bit of what's the other word, not hypocrisy, but um, I don't know. I tend to be a mechanical valve kind of guy. And I like mechanical valves. I like mechanical things. Well, I think we're all, I think we're all very familiar with them over the past several years. But, many years, but in many, a con many decades, possibly. In a conversion application, one thing that you might want to consider is the use of an electric EPR, which we're going to talk about here. That's correct. Very shortly. That's correct. Now, troubleshooting sorts in general. If you have an EPR that will not hold setting, you're seeing low pressure, here are some things you can consider. And they are verify the valve setting, and of course, you had turned clockwise to raise the setting. You could ensure hot gas is flowing to the pilot connection. Mm -hmm. You, we've got a strainer in there that catches the hammer handles in the lunch boxes. That's correct. Because that pilot valve may be contaminated with debris. Now you've got an EPR that's not holding setting, but you got a high pressure. What could happen there? You might have a bleed line restriction, or again 
might have debris, debris contamination, contamination. Yep. causing the piston to stick. Now what's going on here, John? We've got some more troubleshooting guidelines. Uh, we have kits that you can use to rebuild these valves. And here we're suggesting that the enclosing tube lock nut torque range is nine to 10 foot pounds. Over tightening that assembly can cause the enclosing tube plunger to bind up and it will, will keep the valve from functioning properly. Right, you do not want to over torque that connection. Uh, everybody, I think, has a tendency to want to make sure everything is very tight to keep from having leakage problems. But in this case, uh, the recommended torque is recommended for a good reason. Yeah. And my brothers who worked in this industry for as long as I can remember had a term for over tightening, and it had something to do with the bull and the back end of it and how tight that is. Uh -huh. And that's probably something I can't say in public. But probably not. You need to be careful. Probably not. Now, Referring to bulletin 30-11, we'll get some more information to you regarding the installation and selection of, of solenoid valves, which you might find useful, and you could pull that off of our website for free. Mm -hmm. Now, we got some more details here regarding uh, replacement parts and kits for rebuilding sorts. We have pilot valve kits, internal parts kits, gaskets, O-rings, you'll see here that we've depicted several different enclosing tube styles that we have utilized over the years to, to present day. Mm -hmm. And we have a Sporlin replacement parts catalog. It's called Bulletin 122, and that is available for you to download. What's the cost on that, John? Oh, that would be zero. That's free as well. Cost, that, is, that would be zero. Right. Now, here's an interesting thing. Okay. Here's a question we get asked all the time. And John, you being the refrigerants expert, I think this would be something good for you to tell us about. Okay, I can do that. So as we, uh, you know, get into more, more and more refrigerants uh, in systems that exhibit glide, and uh, that uh, the uh, diagram that we have up here. Uh, depicts a zeotrope, in this case, R47A, so a zeotropic blend. Um, if you look at a pH diagram like this, you can always tell because your lines of constant temperature are going to slope downward from left to right. That indicates that you have a glide. And as we map out our process on there, you can tell that you're gonna have some change in temperature uh, through the evaporator, uh, even with uh, holding a constant, a more or less constant pressure. And so, you know, in the real world, you're going to have some pressure drop through the evaporator. But of course, this slide uh, basically depicts the ideal vapor compression refrigeration site. Yeah, no pressure drop to no the pressure heat transfer, yep. and isentropic compression, and all that stuff. Yep. So normally, the TEV is going to be at the factory or the OEM determined setting uh, prior to adjusting the EPR. And there is, you know, some amount of controversy out there regarding. Uh, figuring out the starting point where it comes to setting the EPR if the refrigerant exhibits glide. Uh, some will say to use the dew point, uh, and then some say we'll use uh, basically a midpoint, which would be an average of the dew point and the actual entering of app temp. Uh, that actual entering of app temp, because it is down in the dome in the saturated region, is pretty difficult to determine. And so uh, either way will get you in the ballpark. But um, I think what we can say pretty universally is that when we're dealing with an EPR, uh, we're probably dealing with a piece of equipment, uh, refrigeration equipment, that is going to have a specified typically delivery air temperature or discharge air temperature. So it's going to be a cooler or it's going to be a case or something of that nature that is going to have a proper discharge air temperature and ultimately, where we start doesn't matter nearly as much as where we wind up. And we want to adjust that EPR to deliver the proper discharge air temperature for that case or for that walking. So you can monitor the discharge air temperature and dial it in for that. That's right. Dial it in for that. Um, and uh, if you're using the correct, correct temperature there, you're not going to go wrong. And then you could go back at the end and 
tweak the thermostatic expansion valve if there's a mechanical valve that's right the super that's right if there's uh if there's a, a bit of a superheat problem uh after that uh unlikely that it's going to be but if there is that can always be uh adjusted uh, and, to suit and we're seeing more and more refrigerants with that exhibit a glide because they have a variety of constituents built into the mix of the absolutely refrigerant. absolutely the uh the total number of different 400 series refrigerants those are the the uh, zeotropic blends out there has increased massively over the last uh several years um there used to be uh you know the, the main one out there just used to be r404a it had very low glide um r404a is going away yeah uh, you could ignore the glide on R404A and never really cause a problem. It was it was about one degree F. You could ignore it and never cause a problem. Uh, the 407s, like we've depicted here, their glides are in the range of 10 to 11 degrees. Uh, and if you ignore those, you can definitely cause a problem. Well, here, how, how well does mechanical EPR control work? Well, here's a log of data that was acquired on a system with a mechanical evaporator pressure regulator. It was a medium temp system. Uh, the graph over here displays cape, case temperature, uh, discharge air temperature versus time, and the set point is roughly 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. As you can see, the temperature varies approximately plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit over time if you follow this graph. It's, and it's fairly consistent, and I would presume that these are defrost cycles that you see I spiking up. Definitely assume this. Uh, the same. If you can live with plus or minus one degree variation, this is not a bad way to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, let's let's keep moving. Some supermarkets control the flow of refrigerants to each case solely based on a need for cooling. That would be the case with the that would be the case to the refrigerated case with a solenoid valve and thermostatic temperature control method. I say thermostatic, literally thermostat. Mm -hmm. With this method, when the case temperature increases above set point, the thermostat tells the solenoid valve to open by means of some control system gymnastics and refrigerant flows to the metering device. When temperature is achieved and the thermostat is satisfied, the solenoid valve would close. That's a pretty basic way of doing things. Very basic. Uh, you might see that set up on small standalone units, conventional systems, a walk-in freezer or cooler. And in, in a way, that's what a lot of residential air conditioning systems do. Uh, indeed, it is. You could use it on a multiplex system, but probably not the favored method. Yeah, it would be a very, it, it's a pretty crude method of control when it comes to uh, refrigeration devices. Remember, we just got finished talking about mechanical EPRs and that they respond to inlet pressure to obtain a desired case temperature. In comparison, the valve we're gonna talk about next, the electrically actuated, electronically controlled EEPR responds directly to discharge air temperature to obtain that desired case temperature. You know, we may have just talked a little bit about using this discharge air temperature as a, uh, as a good way to set a valve. Maybe we did. Now, some of you may be familiar with EEVs, used to control superheat? Well, an EEPR is a step motor driven valve similar to that. Let's get into it. Here's some additional detail. In comparison to the EPR, this option requires a controller to accept the discharge air temperature reading from a sensor. Mm -hmm. Discharge air temperature is important stuff. The controller then positions the EEPR accordingly. By stepping the EEPR in the closing direction, Pressure will increase and cause the discharge air temperature to also increase. That's the job in the case of this product line, the CDS valve. CDS. CDS. What does that what, sounds like what? a broadcasting company? What 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 does CDS mean, John? I, <laughs> well, this goes back several years in and of itself, but it actually means controls discharge step. Well, you won't find that reference too many places. Not very many, no, not at all. You'll notice here in this particular example, we've also snuck in an EEV as the metering device, and it serves to control superheat at the outlet of the evaporator in this particular example. Mm 
And here you can see we've depicted a small controller that tells the CDS valve what to decrypt. Regarding controllers, we offer a standalone controller that can be used to drive the EEPR. Examples here, the temperature control, the pressure control, these are all variations of a product line that we refer to as Kelvin controllers. And some case controllers can operate as stand standalone controllers as a, in addition to this. Mm -hmm. More commonly, EEPRs are controlled by dedicated boards or case controls that communicate with the store's EMS or BAS. Correct. That's the energy management system or the building automation system. That allows a technician or a store operator to see and monitor case temperature, valve position, and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, this can take place from the controller or from even a remote location. Remote yep, location. Even a remote location. Now we've talked briefly about standalone controllers. Here's an example of another type of controller. This one can readily interface with the building automation system, that BAS, or the energy management system, the EMS, and can control many additional parameters. These electric valve controllers are classified as integrated controls or case controls. And here's an example, this S3C case control. What, what does S3C stand for, John? Uh, that would stand for safety, service, and security. That's kind of cute. Indeed. Uh, we, we have an online training module for this control. There are some big, big box stores in this country that have really jumped on this product line. They're and adopted them very uh, across, very much across the board. And this case controller drives the EEV, the EEPR, and, and possibly a liquid line solenoid valve. It also has onboard relays that can control lights, uh, defrost, uh, fans, anti-sweat heaters. It can even control an SPW valve. Mm -hmm. and, and what the heck is an SPW? Uh, SPW would stand for Sporlin Pulse Width. So that is a pulse width modulated EEV. That, okay, so you would you would almost treat it like a rapid cycle solenoid valve. It is very much equivalent to a rapid cycle solenoid valve. Interesting. Now, if you use any of these controllers, you've got to have additional accessories that work in conjunction with them. You must have sensors. Now, and choosing the right sensor or sensors is key to the success of this. Now, there's a wide variety of sensors available, both on the temperature and on the pressure side. We have 2K, 3K, and 10K thermistors and more. And what does the 2K or 3K or 10K mean in this situation, John? What is that reference? That would uh, reference the uh, basic amount of resistance across that it's a thermistor, so it is oh. a it is a resistor that acts reacts to temperature. And so that that talks about two thousand ohms or three thousand ohms at a given temperature. Right. All right, that makes sense. Now you can tell the type of sensor by the construction in some instances. The 10K sensor is being used more and more all the time. Yes, it is. And when needed, the appropriate pressure transducers should be selected based on the pressure range seen in the system. For instance, here's zero to 150, zero to 300, zero to 500. Those right. are all models, and I've failed to mention the pounds per square inch gauge. Yep, so the 150 PSIG might be appropriate for the evaporator side of most systems, the suction side of most systems. Uh, if it's a fairly low or medium pressure refrigerant, a 300 PSIG model might be appropriate for high side or discharge. Uh, on a lot of the newer refrigerants, uh, the 500 PSIG model is going to be appropriate for your high side or discharge. Right, and they're color coded so that you can determine what they right. what the, what that means. And 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 John, is it fair to say that pressure transducer or pressure sensor? Are one and the same. It's just a play on words. Yeah, it's uh, it's the uh, wording that you choose to use. Now there's a wide range of products available in this lineup. Some of the versions that we've depicted here are a little dated in their design features, but it's a good illustration nonetheless to give you an overall feel 
that we have EEVs available for superheat control, hot gas bypass, evaporator pressure regulation, like what we're talking mm -hmm. here, and ultimate case temperature. Uh, even there was a time where there was, looks like there was a move in the direction of glycol as a secondary refrigerant. That's correct. That may be making a little bit of a comeback, I've heard. Um, they're still, I think, still interested in it in places, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we've got a series of Kelvin controls that can be used for these different applications. Right. Now, these valves have the advantage of being less sensitive to the refrigerant that's installed in the system and can generally th throttle, throttle down to lower levels as compared to a mechanical valve. Mm -hmm. And here's one real key thing you can, with the proper setup, you can monitor and control these products remotely. That's correct. You have a hard time doing that with a mechanical valve. Mm -hmm. Now, we also offer a wide variety of these CDS valve sizes. We depicted some dated designs here for reference as well. The larger, larger sizes, the CDS 9 and 17, can be easily identified by the brass motor housing. Uh, as and as owner and operators and OEMs all have decided it might be a good idea to install glass doors on their refrigerated cases like you would at home, mm -hmm. reducing the overall refrigeration circuit load in the process, we've discovered a need for smaller CDS valve sizes. And right. hence, we've got CDS 2, 4, and 7. They tend to have a stainless motor housing, at least at this point, and over here is a little newer design, which has a brass housing and a slick M12 removable and reattachable cable assembly. Mm -hmm. Many of our valves in the past, here's an example, had a cable assembly that you could remove. You just, yep. you just weren't going to have much success putting it back Put it on. Back on yep. Now, in the case that you have one of these and you tear it up, we do have replacement motor assemblies that will be happy to sell to. That's correct. Uh, those replacement motor assemblies are typically shipped with the piston at mid-stroke. Uh, if power is applied to the motor prior to reassembly, be sure that that piston has been retracted before you try to install it. And that'll help you from boogering it up, I think mm -hmm. is the technical term. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a little bit of guidance on EEPR controller setup. Keep in mind that depending on the valve type, the resistance across the wire pairs might vary. And many of our valves have 100 ohms of resistance across valve pairs. Some of them have 75. There are different numbers of steps designed into the motor assemblies and that little transmission that's mm -hmm. built into it. Yep. And then we've standardized pretty much on a step rate of 200 steps per second. These things all need to be keyed into the controller when you're setting it up. Correct. Now, as far as troubleshooting EEPRs, controllers will typically allow the technician to see important control parameters and readings. If it's integrated with the EMS system, these readings can be graphed and viewed as time varies. Here's an example of such a graphical display. Uh, the EMS could also show any uh, alarm warnings that might come up if set points are not being met. These systems, again, can be monitored remotely. That's one of the selling points of that. That's correct. Let's take a look at this next slide and we'll we'll zoom down into it a little bit further. The technician or the store manager could look in on areas of the store to investigate alarms and review case parameters and system data. And there's there's a you know a red icon that's come up here as an alarm scenario in this graphical display. Something might not be meeting set set point mm -hmm. somewhere here right. in some of these spots. So in this case, you would have looks like there's a temperature there. Uh, in this example, uh, there's a meat case that's running at minus 24C uh, that apparently is not supposed to be running at minus 24C. So, and you can you could be in your office in Istanbul and be looking at what's going on in a system that's in Alabama. That's correct. If you had an office in Istanbul. I don't know why you would, but you might. Me either. Now let's take a look at this slide. What are we talking about here? What What is this device right here, John? Have you ever seen uh, one of those would, before? That would be the, as labeled, SMA-12. And that means what, you know? 
I do. Oh, I'm, go I'm, ahead. I... It's step motor actuator That's 12 right. volts. We need 12 volts to drive these. And I think I said volts, but it's volts. Volts, yes. Now, if you're ever going to service any of our electrically actuated, electronically controlled valves, you really have a one that need to have one of these. They're an invaluable They're tool. They're very handy to have, yes. I mean, you can, with, with, with this kind of information and in conjunction with one of these, you can determine a whole lot about what's going on in your system. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with these, there's two, two problems with this device. One, if left on a job site, they tend to disappear. I think the term is sublimation. Uh, something like that. Now, the second thing is we tend to put on a mask and get out a gun when we're selling these to you because we're incredibly proud of the little devils. Now, here's something else that's another invaluable tool. It's that simple volt ohm meter. We talked about something about resistance across wire pairs. Well, again, depending on the valve design, the resistance across wire pairs, like either the red and the green or the black and the white, is going to be 75 ohms with a tolerance or 100 ohms with a tolerance. And then likewise, the resistance between any wire and the housing of the valve itself ought to be an open circuit. It certainly should be. And checking that resistance will tell you a lot about what's going on. Now, here's a neat little kit that some of you may not know exists. Now, provided the valve that the mechanical valve, like the case of the A8, the Sport, or the Sort, it, if it's in good serviceable conditions, we offer a motor kit that allows you to convert a mechanical sort, A8 or Sport, to a CDS valve. Because sometimes we've been asked, hey, we have older EPRs in the store. We're doing a renovation project. We're updating our, our energy management system. And we'd like to include some of these new fancy electric valves. Do we have any other option besides changing out the whole valve? Right. Because, you know, the reality is a lot of these valves are installed in places <coughs> that, uh, uh, they may not be accessible, very accessible for un, you know, for unsweating, for unbrazing, mm -hmm. and brazing a new body in place. That can be, you know, really quite an undertaking. Uh, it, there's a lot of other things that might have to be uh, moved or uh, unsweated, and this is a way to do it without even, basically, without even have to, having to get out a torch. You you would have to isolate the valve from system pressure. Mm -hmm. In the case of like a sort to CDS conversion, you'd need to cap or braze off these pilot lines. That's correct. And that photo there, yeah, having the pilot lines uncapped, that would not be a good idea to uh, yeah, that'd to, be a to, to repressurize under those conditions. That would be a de minimis leak, right? Yeah. But this allows for the valve body and the original sweat connections to remain intact. Correct. Now, of course, you'd have to install some method to control the new valve that you create. Mm -hmm. And that's where if you're doing some type of story model and upgrading the system in general, that's where that would right. could come into play. Here's another slide that depicts the conversion process. Here you see the original uh, mechanical parts removed from the body. And then here's an illustration of that motor kit. Mm -hmm. And then here's the complete installation. So it just bolts into that same four bolt flange on top of the valve. And then here's a cutaway of that. And some of the, just basically reiterating some of the things that we've already said. There's a, a reference bulletin that details this information. Mm -hmm. And there are YouTube videos out that show how to do it. That's correct. And it's relatively, straightforward and easy to do. Um, it also applies to many of the refrigerating specialties products. Mm -hmm. And I'm told that this conversion can yield decent energy savings when it's all said and done. That's right, because- uh, Why know, is that? Well, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to a uh, electronic control regime, you can now uh, set up control strategies uh, that are much more sophisticated than just setting to a specific pressure I'm leaving it there, which is essentially what you do with any of these mechanical EPRs. So you can uh, uh, you can not only get better control, which we're going to show 
very shortly here. Oh, now take it easy now. <laughs> Better control of pressure, uh, you can do a little bit more sophisticated control schemes and, uh, and, and gain quite a bit of energy savings in the process. Well, let's take a look and see how that, how that works out. Well, here's an electric EPR control. Here's a log of data that was acquired on a system with that type of control. It was medium temp application again. Mm -hmm. The graph displays temp, uh, case temperature in terms of discharge air versus time. And the set point on this particular situation was around 37 degrees. 37. You'd think they would have made it 36 if we were going to make it. Well, at least it's close. And here you can see the variation, plus or minus one half degree. Yeah. That's not 12, that's one half. That's right. And this tracks fairly consistently with the set point. Yeah. And it recovers nicely after, again, a defrost cycle. If you recall a graph that we showed several slides back, uh, it, it this is really, that other graph uh, showed good control. Oh, oh, you mean that one? That one, that's right. Yeah, you mean that one? That's, that's not better. bad, but how much better is this? I would I would rate that one as a, the one we have there, the electric EPR control. I would rate that an excellent. As, a, as an engineer that's done development work on refrigeration systems, I would rate that an excellent, and the next one is a... And if we compare it to... As a good. The mechanical, it's not... Again, yeah. that's, that's a decent way to do it. That's good. It's been that's done good. for decades. Absolutely, it has. Oh, now, hey, guess what I have? You probably don't know this, but look what I have here. Ooh. If you did it with the liquid line solenoid valve in the thermostat, here's what how that looks. What do you think about this? That looks like spaghetti. Well, here's the thing. It works. It does work. Now, there's a little more variation in the control. Just a touch more. Uh, but if you're satisfied with that level of control, this may be perfectly acceptable for your application. Yeah, there are some applications out there that this is, that this is acceptable for, um, but uh, things that require a little finer temperature control, high value product. You may not want to use this. Right. You know, if you're talking about, uh, you know, high dollar sensitive uh, produce, seafoods, meats, things like that. Uh, you can do better and we've shown you how. Well, basically you pay your money and you take your pick. Mm -hmm. Boy, John, that time went by really fast and we're almost finished with this webinar today. All right. Do, do we have any questions that we need to try to we, answer. We do have a few more questions. Do we now? We do have a few You more think questions. you can answer any of them? Uh, I may be able to answer a couple of them. Okay. Uh, possibly. You want to give it a stab? All right. So, a question, a question here from Chris. Do the SORIT valves allow backflow to similar to other industrial refrigeration solenoid valves? And he gives an example of an S4A or an S8F, which are uh, RS products, are counterparts uh, in the, on the industrial side. So I think when we talk about the SORIT valves, if we look at the direct acting, the SORIT, uh, or actually ORIT in that or case. six and tens. The, the ORITs do not do allow not. backflow. No. But the SORITs, the 12, 15, and 20, I think. Now I know that the SORIT pies can be backflow. That's correct. You can backflow the SORIT pies, I'm not 100% sure that you can backflow the sort 12, 15, and 20. Yeah, I'm not so sure either. But I know you can do it with the sort pi. Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe that's correct. I believe that's correct. Did, did we answer that well enough with it? We're not I, sure. I hope so. I hope so. Let's go to the next one that we can't answer, John. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Abraham asks, any advantage from the sort pi over the sport valve? And those are getting ooh, in. Those ooh, are getting into ooh, again. That's getting ooh, into more of ooh. the industrial side. Here's balance. the thing. Can, may I comment on this? Yes, absolutely. Being having been a pressure regulating valve product manager, I think twice mm -hmm. here. At one time, the lineup of are the sales of valves kind of fell into this category. Sorts, standard sorts, led to charge. Mm -hmm. Sort pies and their refrigerating specialty counterpart sport valves were kind of neck and neck. Mm -hmm. I think as time went by, the sport valve absolutely trumped it. 
it I would use different terms if we were talking in a in a non mixed audience. Mm -hmm. But orts sorts did real well. Sports did nicely. The pie suffered, and I think unfortunately the pie valve suffered from application issues early on, and it was cleaned up with some design changes in our part. There are places and areas of the country that love it. We continue to sell it in, in, in numbers that I am surprised to see. And as far as comparing it to say a sport valve, the sport valve and the other refrigerating specialties products lend themselves to quick turnaround within limits. It's modular. Mm -hmm. And that means refrigerating specialties can build the valve and ship it out to you in non-crazy times like we have now. That's right. And so that's a benefit. The the maybe the downside to the product is the fact that it's a it's a collection of modular components and it has gasketed surfaces in between each one of those components. Mm -hmm. That means there is some propensity for the formation of leaks that can be troublesome. So again, if you have a preference for one over the other, they both can get the job done. And having said all that, it seems as though the world is moving more and more to, to the electrically actuated, electronically controlled mix of products because of the benefits that they bring. Mm -hmm. You think that answered the question, John? I think so. Okay. Got another one? Eloquently, actually. Thank you. Okay. Maybe not as distinguished as what you sound. So, uh, or maybe so. Maybe so. What else you got? All right. So, a question from Jack, and this refers to the uh, uh, temperature control graphs that we have uh, that we have just displayed. Yes. Maybe I should get those up. Uh, potentially. And the question is, what is the TD for the previous graph? And when we Ooh. say TD, I'm not 100% sure um, uh, what we're referring to here, but I think maybe talking about the um, difference between the actual base suction pressure mm -hmm. that, the, that the valve is controlling off of versus the evaporator pressure that it is, or evaporator right. temperature by proxy, that it is controlling to. Me, and and all I don't those, know if I have that information, but let me. I, I'm not sure that we do have that information at our fingertips, but I'm sure that we can find that out. Well, let's look at the mechanical version here. I I know it's not detailed here. Yeah. Or I don't think it is. No, I don't. No, I don't have that. But we could very likely get that, convey it to yeah to Don for these three examples. So TD for the temperature control graphs. That's correct. I can, Don, if you're still listening, I can see if I can get that information and convey it to you. That's acceptable to me because uh, everybody that's logged in today will get a nice thank you email. And of course, uh, we can we can relate back to that. Was that? Uh, yeah, let me, I'll tell you Brian, what, I'll get, uh, I'll get that. And I'll also confirm the reverse flow for defrost through the sort 12, 15, and 20. I don't think we can. But I'll double check that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll find a way to communicate that back out. All right. So those are two. All right. John, we have any other questions? We do. We do indeed. And have more rolling in. So we've definitely got some interest here. Um, from a uh, question from Damien. Are the actuators on EEVs replaceable without having to pump down and isolate the valve and remove refrigerant? And in this case, uh, I think that we have to say you're, you're talking about motor motor I, motor yeah, housing talk about motor, motor housing on there and uh they actually are not you got to isolate the valve from system you have pressure. to isolate the valve from system pressure just like as if you were doing a sort to cds conversion you got to isolate the valve because you're going to correct you're going to expose the inner workings of that valve to atmosphere correct you are um the uh motor the motors on all these um all these valves that we're talking about here, uh, these are all uh, hermetically sealed wetted motors. In other words, you have a you have a certain amount of refrigerant and a little bit of refrigeration oil that can actually get into the motor housing. Uh, that's the way they're designed. That's the way they've been designed from the start. And as a result, uh, you do have to isolate and pump down to be able to change that. Now, in fairness to Damien, there are EEVs out on the market 
that are not that way. That's correct. There are others, other manufacturers uh, that have what was what is called a dry uh, stator EEV. And in fact, and in fact, if I can back up, John, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, let me see if I can find it here. We may have, we do have a model uh, of our own, and we may have, it may have been depicted and in I'll, that one slide. And I'm going to show it to you here. I think if I can get to it, I think this little guy right here might be such well that's that is true the, the glycol valve here that we have here I mean, it's not refrigerant but it is not refrigerant that glycol valve there uh that is a non-wetted motor design um because yeah. motors don't like to run with with glycol and water inside really they don't yeah, are you not, sure not at all not okay. at all i'm sure there's problems there. yeah. yeah all right so well there you go all right that's a good question um moving on next question so uh, this is from Joe. What is the difference between the CDS and the CDST valves? And that was a rather simple one. You take uh, T again, as we uh, outlined for another valve, stands for uh, pressure tab. And so a CDST valve has a built-in pressure tab, um, much like is depicted here. Uh, let's see. Do we have a? We do not no, actually have no, a CDS. Yeah, um, I mean, we got a pressure tap on it. And I'll tell you what. Let me back up here and see if there is one showing that. Uh, I'll see. No, not no, really. No, there. No, no, no. This is an interesting uh, development right here, though, because this shows a valve that has a moisture indicator built into the housing. That would be in the case of this product line, SEH. I, yep. but I don't think I have elected to show one with, I'm scanning through these slides. I'm not seeing one that shows the pressure tab, but that is a, that is what that is. Okay. Um, so yeah, that is, again, that's what it is. Um, even though we don't happen to have one picture this time around. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question. Is it recommended to use both valves uh, as an uh, electronic uh, expansion valve and an electronic EPR uh, uh, to get, you know, to increase system performance. So uh, what we've shown, uh, exactly what we've shown right here. Um, I, it's, you're, you're splitting hairs now. Yeah. Right. That's, I mean, that's correct. You can do this setup that we have here with an electric evaporator pressure regulator and with a properly selected and dialed in and installed thermostatic expansion valve and get pretty good performance. You can take it to the next level by including the EEV by the simple fact of nothing else, you've got remote control and monitoring capabilities that you don't really have. That's correct. That's, that's, that's one correct. of the big saving graces of it. And if you think down the road, you're gonna do remodels that involve new refrigerants you could maybe make the argument that a combination of an EEV and a CDS valve might be more forgiving to a remodel to a new refrigerant. Then I, would, I think that's definitely true. Because a thermostatic expansion valve, a TEV, is very, very, very sensitive to the refrigerant that's in the system, especially because you got the valve sizing and you've got the thermostatic charge to consider, all of which are specific generally to either a refrigerant or a very select group of refrigerants. Mm -hmm. But I'm also gonna say, you can get a TEV and a CDS valve to work in unison very well. Yes, you can. I've, I've um, worked on systems where that was the case and you can get very good control, uh, very good efficiency using a properly sized and properly adjusted TEV Keywords being properly adjusted and that's properly and, sized and that's tricky and <laughs> that that's, can be tricky and that's tricky and that's that's another saving or selling point behind the EEV because it's you select it you install it and you key the parameters into the controller whatever the controller might be as opposed to dialing in and adjusting superheat on a mechanical valve which is time consuming mm -hmm. it is it is so. All right, uh, moving on. This is really more of a comment, and uh, we thank Brian for the comment. And uh, the sport valve, this is to the discussion we were having oh, a couple of questions back. Right. 
The sport also allows for field flexibility and function as a result of the modular design. And that's a great point, Brian. It, it does. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great Absolutely. point. And again, we've not focused on that product line during the course of this discussion, uh, but as time goes by, we're planning on that for a future webinar. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm not exactly sure when that's going to happen. Yep. Um, so I think possibly as things stand here, our final question is, uh, can you put the EEPR valves outside? Now, if we mean, if, if by outside we mean uh, completely exposed to weather, uh, as in sun and rainfall and winter weather icing and things like that, um, I'm not sure that I would necessarily be comfortable with that. Um, there is nothing there that would, that would necessarily inherently uh, hurt that. These are very well sealed valves. I mean, it's an IP67 rating. That's correct. It is. As far as ingress pr protection is concerned. Right. Uh, uh, you know, the sun's going to have damaging effects on the cable. Right. I would be, I would be concerned about, you know, uh, UV damage on the, on the cable. Uh, no question. But in terms of, if we're talking about outside, as in uh, having these valves in an unheated outdoor equipment house of something or something of that nature, uh, there's no problem there. Yeah, these uh, the the uh, possible range of uh, of ambient temperatures for these valves is extremely wide, and I would not be concerned a bit about about that. Sounds so, good to me. Is that was that the end of the questions, John? Uh, at this time, I believe that is the end of the question. Just to let folks know who are still with us, you can get a lot of resource information by going going to sporland.com. You can access our virtual engineer selection software. You can download all of our reference information. You can go to Sporland Video and watch all the pre-recorded webinars that we have out online. You can do all this for free. You mm -hmm. can also call our Sporland Tech Support Line at 636-239-1111 and we yep. will not charge you a thing to access thing. that. And I, I will mention too that if you're, I mean, there seems to be a lot of times a lot of interest in those valve conversions from the previous mechanical valves to the CDS type valves. There are some very good videos on YouTube on that. Absolutely, absolutely. Just point those out in particular. And just to remind you, we again, if Donna let us come back, we've got two more webinars scheduled to do, one That's on correct. head pressure control in October, and then a, a subsequent one on thermostatic expansion valves in December. And Donna had also asked us to share our image with you. Oh, that's here. right. Let's see if I can get that to work. No one can see you. Click to share. It's being stubborn. There we are. <laughs> Almost high. And there we are. That's John. I'm Jim. It's there been a pleasure are. to be here. And thank you, Don, for letting us join you today. My pleasure. You guys did a wonderful job. And hopefully this was helpful. And uh, check us out in October and December for more information. All good. Well, thank you. I think I'm in charge of shutting this down now, right? You can go ahead and do it. Absolutely. All right, sir. Thank you all very much. Yep, thanks to everyone.